here today, Lord, with anything in our hearts that we need to confess before you, Lord. I pray, God, that we just take a second to get our hearts right so that we can be in a right place to worship together and hear from your word today. Father, we pray that you would bless us as a church as we worship you and we lift our hands to you and hear from your word today that Pastor Dave is going to be delivering to us here shortly. And I pray, God, that you would bless this time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, 
thank you so much for the opportunity to gather together in your house to worship. And Father, we thank you again for the opportunity not only to give you praise and glory uh, in song, but also certainly to give you praise, glory, and to worship you through the teaching and the preaching of your word. So I pray, Father, that you would guide us in our uh, message today. And Father, again, that you would be honored and glorified in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Justified, for sharing with us today. And uh, we know there's power in, in Almighty God and what He has done in our life. He uses music. He certainly uses the Word of God to instruct us and to encourage us uh, together. So I'm going to ask if you would to take your Bibles this morning and turn to the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, we're in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. And if you are using a pew Bible and you need it, it's page 1126. Uh, we, over the last couple of weeks... Uh, have taken a look at two specific parables, uh, two very challenging parables. And if you were not here for our message and study time together, I'd encourage you to get those CDs or to look them up online on Facebook and examine the messages together. But we looked at the parable of the unforgiving person uh, and the sinfulness of the unforgiving spirit or the unforgiving heart. And then also last week, of the simple heart of being bitter or the bitterness. And these are, these are heart issues. And as we consider these two teachings uh, here in the scriptures, then we also understand the problem of not just hearing the word and then following and doing the word of God. But in today's parable here in Matthew chapter 13, we're going to see a parable that talks about the different types of hearts. Mm -hmm. Now all of us obviously have a heart that beats, correct? Otherwise, you wouldn't be sitting. Well, some of you, I have to check to see if your heart's beating or not. Um, our hearts are, obviously, we, we have the physical aspect, but sometimes our heart is not receptive. Have you ever noticed that sometimes when you go to church, you're, you're just excited about being there, and boy, I tell you, when the message is preached, the songs are sung, boy, you're just receptive to what the Word of God has to say, and it makes a change in your life. And then another week when you go, you're there, but that might be about it. And the Word of God doesn't seem to challenge you as much. There are four types of heart that are mentioned, hearts that are mentioned here in this parable. And we need to examine them because they re really show us a better picture of how it is that we can hear the Word of God and we can take it and we can use it and it can be profitable in our life or it could not be profitable. Look at Matthew chapter 13. I'm going to read for you, if you would follow along, verses 3 through 9. This is the parable that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, is teaching here. By the way, if you go back to the previous chapter, he preaches this sermon the same day that he had preached a message. Uh, and in that particular message, his enemies reviled him. Uh, they kind of you know, were coming back at him with all types of discussions and so on, trying to get him off track, certainly. And then he also had some interruptions by his family uh, at the end of that chapter. And he was never discouraged, if you would. Now we think about Christ and say, well, he shouldn't be discouraged. But think about the application. When you preach and teach the Word of God, there are going to be those that are going to say, well, that's not what it is, or he really doesn't have any bearing. And look at how many pastors are walking out of pulpits today. They're discouraged because the, the people aren't, aren't taking the Word of God. They aren't growing from the Word of God. We need to continue to keep on preaching the Word of God. This is, this is our book. This is our guide. So uh, we, we need to continue to be faithful. Now the Pharisees, by the way, they were not at the seaside here when Jesus teaches this parable in Matthew chapter 13. They were at the synagogue. And more than likely, we can make the application, the Pharisees and the scribes thought they were a little bit better than everybody else. Uh, we see that throughout Scripture. So they probably thought it was beneath them to go to the seaside. But here in this particular parable, let's see what Jesus teaches us, beginning in verse 3 of Matthew chapter 13. Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. 
but others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. And then notice the challenge uh, that we had shared with you in our previous parables. He who has ears to hear, let him do what? Hear. Let him pay attention. Let him listen. Father, teach us from your word today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The sower in this passage, if you go, go ahead to verse 37, uh, you'll find that the sower is the Lord himself or the ministers of, of, the, of the ministry for God. We're responsible to sow the seed. Now you say, well, is that a pastor's job? It's his responsibility to do that. But all of us have a responsibility to be sharing the seed, to be spreading the seed, if you would. Um, I right now am feeding the deer behind my house. And so every night, uh, right around 4, 30, 5 o'clock, I go out and I put piles of corn back there. And I put it out there so that they can enjoy it, so on and so forth. But mostly so that I can see the pictures of them whenever my camera takes pictures of them a little bit later on. But my point is, I put that out there and I'm sowing that corn. I'm putting it out there for them to enjoy. When it comes to, to the church, when it comes to the Sunday hour, teaching hours, or whatever, we are supposed to be putting out the Word of God. That's our responsibility as a church. You also have that responsibility. So from Monday through Sunday, whatever the day of the week is, you and I have the responsibility to be sharing the Word of God, to be putting it out there. Throw the seeds out, let the deer eat it, put the seed out there, let the people hear the word of God, and then remember it's the responsibility of whom to make that word grow in their life. That's the Holy Spirit's responsibility. Okay, so we put it out there, that's our responsibility to do it. God is going to give the increase, that's his job, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, you're reminded, Paul says in there, that he said, I kind of planted the seed. Apollos came along and he watered it a little bit. He said, but don't give us credit because who gives the increase? God gives the increase. Our responsibility is to share the word of God. The effect of the word of God then is going to be dependent upon what your heart's like. And there are four instances here in this parable. So let's take a look at them quickly this morning if we could. The first one is found in verses 3 and 4. And this is the seed that goes by the wayside. I would say that this is the heart that is closed to the Word of God. The heart that is closed to the Word of God. If you would, we've already read verses 3 and 4. Go over to verse 19. And while you're looking at verse 19, let me just share this with you. The idea of the wayside, you've all driven through Amish country, have you not? Okay, and it's like you're driving down the road, especially during the summer, and there's corn on both sides of the road. And there's a road right down the middle where you're traveling. That's the idea, and that's what would happen in biblical times. They actually put the road, the roads were right through the fields. So when they were going from point A to point B, they were basically driving through the fields. They didn't have the roads like you and I did. It wasn't until the Romans came along later and built all of the highway system that they had. But at that time, this, the idea of this wayside is almost similar to what we think of when we drive through an Amish area. It's like a road right in between the two corns of field. And the soil there was packed down solid by the feet from people walking, from the animals being on it, from the, from the wheels on the carriages, so on and so forth. And it was almost like that soil had become concrete. And you've, you've obviously been in places like that over the course of your life. So the soil was almost impossible to allow the seed to be able to penetrate and be able to grow. And that's what we're talking about here. And so in verse 4, when it talks about the wayside, the seeds were kind of laying on top. They were just laying on top of the soil. They weren't really getting penetrated down. And notice what happens in verse 19. Because in verse 19, beginning in verse 19, I should say down through verse 23, Jesus explains this parable. And again, for those that haven't been with us, the parables were not, they were not for the people that were around. They were to use to basically to teach the disciples. So when, when Jesus said a parable, if you notice there in chapter 13 a little bit later, and we looked at this already, when he taught the parables, it was basically to confuse those who were around us, make them think a little bit, and then he would take the disciples off and he would explain them to them. Uh, we've already looked at that before. We won't examine it again. But look at verse 19. He says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom, it does not understand it. 
then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received the seed by the wayside that we read back in verses 3 and 4. Okay, so you see the parallel here. See what Jesus is going to do. And as he's teaching, it's the, the, the idea of that bird that he's described there. He calls him the wicked one. So obviously we're talking about Satan. Have you ever wondered why two people can sit in a church, in, in a service, they can hear the same message. One could be moved to respond and one would not respond to it. Have you ever noticed that? Okay, so what is happening? There, there are two aspects here of the closed heart. I want to just give them to you quickly. The closed heart could often, and sometimes it is, it's the person who has never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. They are not going to receive the Word of God. You don't need to turn to it, but 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Paul talks about the natural man, the unregenerate man, the man who has not come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. He can't understand the Scriptures because he doesn't have the Spirit of God to teach him. The unregenerate man, his, his mind is closed. Verse 10 in that same chapter says, it's the Spirit of God. And we talk about this all the time. It's the Spirit of God that helps us to understand what the Bible has to say. So the closed mind could very well be someone who has not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. But it also could be a, found in the believer. It's, it's the believer who comes. You sit in the house of God. You sit in a, in a teaching hour, whatever it might be. And it's, it's, it's mostly fashionable. In other words, you came even as the scribes and the Pharisees did. You came just so that you could be seen. There's no intention of allowing God's word to really penetrate. And what happens, you notice there in verse 19, that's the careless, the, the mindless, the, the, the hearer that's just pray to the wicked one. So the words of God come, and even though Satan is a great thief of, and the murderer of souls, he also steals, if you would, he steals and robs what the word of God has to say. Because our heart isn't prepared. We're not ready to worship God. We're not ready to take in the Word of God. Perhaps there is, as, as Pastor Barry prayed a little bit earlier in the service, the idea that, that, our, that we have sin in our heart, and because we have, we're not in fellowship with God, we're not ready to hear the Word of God. Here's what I want to challenge us with. You need to break up the hard ground. What do we mean? You, you need and I need to prepare my heart when I come to God's house. Because we have all kinds of things that go on throughout the week or whatever. But I, I need to be prepared. When I open up the Bible at my house or whatever it might be, I want to become humble to the Word of God. I want it to grab my attention. So when you come to church and you hear a message or whatever, please be, be prepared before you get there. Have your heart ready to hear the Word of God. You go to a Bible study and you're there and just be encouraged that, that you hear what you hear is going to help you and teach you and lead you into a better walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Not this seed that falls by the wayside. This seed that falls by the wayside here in these first couple verses is the seed that just quite honestly, their heart's closed. And I would pray that you're not here today and your heart's closed to the Word of God. Be open to what the Word of God has to say. Amen? Be, be, be ready to hear and ready to listen. It isn't that everybody who stands before you is perfect or that everybody has all of the answers. That's not the point. The point is the Word of God is what's going to teach you and instruct you. All right? So be prepared. Don't, don't be like that which falls by the wayside. Quickly then, notice the second one in verses 5 and 6. This is the heart that's kind of careless. Careless with the Word of God. In verses 5 and 6, we find this is the word that falls on the stony places. We already read that, but I want you to go down to verses 20 and 21 to see what the explanation is. This stony ground, if you think about it, it's like a, there was a, a thin layer of soil on top, but underneath it was either rock or clay. If you don't understand that, come over to my house and take a shovel and, and just dig in our front yard. All right, we have about this much topsoil, and underneath it is nothing but clay. And so in the summer, what happens to the grass? It all turns, it burns, it's not, you know, it just disappears. We tried to plant some, some types of things out in the yard, and they don't make it. You know, they last about three or four months, and then they're just not growing because the soil is not any good. It's that stony ground, if you would. So the, the plants did fine growing at the beginning because they had a little bit of soil there. 
But then all of a sudden, when the sun came up and it got a little bit too hot, according to this parable, what happens to them? They get burnt, they get scorched, and they die. Notice, if you would, verse 20. Here's the explanation of what Jesus says. He who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word. So that would be us, right? You're, you're in church today, you hear the word. You immediately receive it with joy, but you have no root in himself. He endures only for a little while, because then when tribulation or persecution arises because of the world, immediately he does what? He stumbles and he falls. These are the, the emotional here. The, 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 the person who, and sometimes this happens, we'll, we'll turn on a television and uh, there's some dynamic preacher. All right, or you go to church and, you, and and after the service is over, and this will happen. So don't don't stop saying this. All right, but you'll come after the service and say, "Boy, Pastor, that was a really great message," and you're all emotional about it because it's something that the, it just it just got your attention. It's something that really really got your attention that day. But there's no lasting profit in your life at all. That's the idea of the stony ground. Now, Pastor Barry hasn't gotten to this in in his Hebrew study yet. But in, in Hebrews chapter 6, Paul is challenging us to this idea of perfecting, this, this idea of progressing in our lives spiritually, beyond the elementary, if you would, beyond the elementary teachings of Scripture. And it says in verse 5 there that they tasted the Word of God, but they didn't grasp everything about the walk with God. And, and that's the problem with far too many of us as believers. We like to come to church oft times. We want to hear something good. We want to hear a good illustration. Have you ever noticed those are the things you remember during the week? You want to hear the illustrations. You want to, you, you want to hear something from God's Word, but no matter how many times you get confronted, and this is what Paul was talking about there in Hebrews, no matter how many times you get confronted about it over and over again, you just don't listen. You just don't repent. And the problem with far too many of us as Christians is the Word of God, we're, we're there because we think we need to be in church. We're there because we, we think that's the right thing to do, and it is. But notice there in verse 21, they received the Word, and then when the sun came, all of a sudden, when things started going bad, they had a trial, they had a persecution, you have something go wrong in your life, then all of a sudden, you, you just can't handle it. You just can't handle the heat. And when, when we think about that in terms of the Lord, listen, listen, when the Word of God takes root in your life, you can handle what comes along. Does that mean that it's going to be easy for you? No. As a church, we know that. Do we not? It doesn't mean it's going to be an easy life. But we have the presence of God that's going to enable us to be able to handle the things that come along in our life. And that's why the relationship and the walk with God and that fellowship with God is so important. But there are far too many times when we have the heart that it's just the cares that we're just careless with the word. It really doesn't mean a whole lot to us. We kind of just just leap through it. Um, Barney and Clarence uh, here in our church, and there's others. Um, you know, when when they got the word that they had cancer, one of the things that always um, had, had, that always just encouraged my heart is that even in the midst of that, they claimed the presence. And the power of God and his promise that God would always be with them through that. And even though they didn't like the prognosis or they didn't like what they were going through, their faith was strong and, and, and they were able to, to hold on to the fact that God says, I'm going to be with you through this. See, that, that's, that's the essence of the good soil that we're going to see at the end of this, of this parable. But far too many times as a Christian, when this persecution comes, then we just, you know, God, well, where are you? We talked about this in our 930 hour this morning. God's presence is always there, and he preserves us and protects us for eternity. And so we need to be encouraged by that. Um, why is it so easy for Christians to stay away from the house of God? I'm not talking about COVID, you know, but far too many times as Christians, we get sporadic. You know, we'll, we'll be in church for a while and then we'll miss for so many, you know, it just, it doesn't really matter. Why, why is it that way? It's because your heart's like the stony ground. It's, it's an emotional thing. 
And it's, it's not something that makes a difference in your life. Look quickly, if you would, at the third heart. It starts in verse 7, or it's explained in, in excuse me, it's written in verse 7, and then it's explained over in verse 22. And this is a heart that's too crowded. And I think oftentimes this is where the believer is, to be quite honest with you. If you really want to hear the Word of God, and you really want to understand what the Bible has to say, you have to learn how to eliminate the things that crowd out God's Word. The thorns, the things that are mentioned. Look at verse 22. He who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word. And then notice what happens. The cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches do what to the word? What's the scripture say? It chokes the word and he then, that person then becomes unfruitful. These thorns or these briars, they represent, if you, if you would, this heart that's full of what we call rival crops. These things that are in our life, that, that take, they take more precedence. The seed was rooted in good soil, but then the thorns just kind of choked it out, if you would. It didn't have any effect on it. What, is, what does he say, Jesus say? He says it's the cares or the worries of the world. Notice what he says in that parable. The cares of everyday living just kind of eat up the vigor of our soul. It, it, just, it just tears us. We get distracted. Our attention is diverted from the duty that we have to grow in the Word, to study the Word, because of all the things that are going on around us. Look at Matthew chapter 6. Just go back a couple of chapters. Matthew chapter 6, uh, verse 25. Jesus, again, teaching here. He says, I say to you, don't worry about your life, what you're going to eat or what you will drink. Now, I would say for most of us today, um, about 6.30 this evening, 6 o'clock this evening, we're going to be worried about two things. We're going to be worried about the, kick, the, the introduction to the Super Bowl and how much food we can consume. Um, I, I heard something yesterday. I was amazed that there will be approximately 1.4 million chicken wings consumed today. <laughs> Those poor chickens. 1.4 million chicken wings. We only ordered two dozen. But anyway, in Matthew chapter 6, notice what he says. He says, don't worry about your life, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, nor about your body, what you're going to put on. Is not life more than food in the body, more than clothing? Listen, the cares of this world. Guys, we put so much emphasis, we put so much emphasis on what we have in life. Whether it be the clothes that he's talking about, whether it be the things of life, we put so much emphasis on that. Jesus says, don't be concerned about those things. Now that doesn't mean that I don't have a job and I just lay back and you know expect somebody else to take care of me and drop grapes into my mouth or whatever it might be. But he says, that can't be the ultimate. But far too often in the Christian walk, that because the cares of the world take over the teaching of the Word of God. Notice he continues. Look at the birds of the air, verse 26. They don't, they don't sow, they don't reap, uh, gather into their barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And he says, aren't, aren't you more valuable than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to a statue? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't toil, they spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon... In all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And Solomon, if you remember from the teaching of the Old Testament, I mean, he just he had everything when it comes to the possessions of the world. If God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. Don't worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what will we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. But seek first, what? We sing this chorus. The kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And again, it's not that we don't provide for the needs of this life. But we don't allow those cares to choke out the important time in the word of God. How, think about your, your life this past week. Did you find that the things of your daily routine choked out the amount of time that you could spend in, the, in, the, in God's Word or the amount of time that you could spend in prayer? 
If it did, then the, you, you need to examine, I need to examine, are the cares of this life taking over the place of God's word and God's instruction and teaching in my life? It's very simple to think about it. Because this stony ground, if you would, all of a sudden the thorns and all the cares of the world start to have more, they start to have more, if you would, value than God's presence in my life. And, and that's when we, we end up having problems. Notice again the value there in verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God. If, you're, if you are seeking that first and you're faithful in your walk with God, he'll take care of all of those other areas. We've shared this many times, and this is not a, a message on, on tithing or the finances, but... You know, I, I've, there are so many of you in this church who have exemplified over and over again, you're, when you're faithful when you're giving and you're tithing, it's amazing how God makes things so that you know, ends meet, so to speak. You know, when we're faithful in those areas, God takes care of the rest of it. We put Him first and so on. Notice He also says there in that verse, the deceitfulness of riches. You know, far too many times, as a Christian even, we're so busy making a living building up the bank accounts, that we don't even have time for life. We don't even have time for the things of life. How many families are destroyed because the father works over and over and over again, and he doesn't spend the time with his children. He doesn't tend to spend time teaching them. He doesn't spend the time nurturing them. That's that aspect of it, let alone the spiritual part of our life. He says the deceitfulness of riches. Notice that, notice he doesn't say the riches. He talks about the deceitfulness of the riches. Listen, if God has blessed you with, with, a, with, a, with an income through your job or whatever, and you're wealthy, that's great. He doesn't say there's anything wrong with that. It's the love of that that's the root of all evil, the scriptures teach. So it's this idea of putting confidence in the Lord's provision over, over my own. And these thorns that are mentioned here are a sign of neglect in my life. I neglect the necessary time in the things of the Lord, the things of the God of God. Just an evaluation. And then notice quickly the fourth verse, or the fourth heart that's here in verse 8, and then also in verse 24, 23. Excuse me. It's the heart that really allows God's word to cultivate and grow. Isn't this the type of heart that we want to have? We don't want to be choked out. We don't want all these other things to take us. Notice it's unlike all of the other hearts that are mentioned. Uh, I'm going to read verse 8 again. He says, Others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. We'll come back to that in a moment. Verse 23, Jesus says, He who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word, he understands it, which is through the Holy Spirit working, and who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. This is unlike any of the other hearts. You're, you're ready to receive the word of God. And you allow God's word to take a deep root in your heart. And you remove the weeds that are in your life. And you end up producing a good crop. Isn't that the type of life that you would want as a believer? That's the type of life that we, we ought to desire. Our study on Wednesday night. Galatians chapter 5. We won't turn there now, but verses 22 and 23. These are the qualities, this, this idea, the qualities that, that would make me more like Christ. I would want to have them in my life. We've got to go there. Now, right, go to Galatians 5. I want you to see it. Maybe it'll encourage you to come out and, and study together with us on Wednesday as well. Galatians chapter 5. Th these are the things that you and I should be pursuing. This, these are the things. I have these because of, of God's presence in my life. <laughs> Galatians 5, verse 22 says, the fruit of the Spirit. And then he lists them. I've I, I got to say this because I, I say it a lot of times. Because it really is bothersome to me that people say the fruits of the Spirit. Does it say fruits in your, in your scripture? No. You know why it's singular? Because the fruit of the Spirit, you should have all of these. Sometimes we, when we say fruits, it's idea, well, I have this one, but I don't have that one. Okay, it's not a choice. The fruit of the Spirit, I should be exemplifying all of these. And then he goes on to say what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the things that should be evident in my life. These are the, the traits of the Lord Jesus Christ that should also be evidenced in my life. The qualities that, that help me to pursue that godly living in my life. 
These are the things that, that come as a result of, this, of the word of God coming to a heart that's in the good soil. It doesn't say that the good ground doesn't have any stones in it. If you go back and read this text, it doesn't say that there's, there aren't any thorns around. It's just that they don't hinder the fruitfulness. The cares of the world aren't choking you. They aren't choking the things of the world. The, the things of life, the cares of the life. Listen, as a saint, as a believer in Jesus Christ, you're not, you're not free from, from, the, from the remains of sin. But you are free from the reign of it in your life. Amen? You're, you're not free from the remains of sin, but you are free from its reign. It doesn't have to reign in our life. And so I take this good soil, if you would. Notice verse 23. These are the intelligent hearers. They, they, they understand it. They're a fruitful hearer. When you practice the word of God, it bears fruit in your life. Listen, when you practice the traits, when you practice the fruit, when you practice God's living in your life, it will produce fruit. It will produce things in your life that will give honor and glory to Him. Notice there in verse 23, and also back uh, previously in verse 8, there's different fruit levels. You ever notice that? It says some 100, some 60, and some 30. That's, some Christians are more fruitful than others. That's just, that's just the way it is. All right? We're all supposed to be desiring the higher degree of fruit, if you would. But we're all supposed to be producing fruit, whatever it may be, okay, depending upon what you have. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58 says that I, I always abound in the work of the Lord. I'm always doing the work of the Lord. If your heart in the soil is good, you're going to grow. You're going to be used to the Lord. That's the heart that you need to have. And that's the heart that you and I need to have when we open up the Word of God every single day. Is I'm, I'm opening it up and I'm listening to the Word of God. I'm reading it. And as I, the Holy Spirit helps me, I understand it. When I go to church or I go to some teaching hour or whatever it may be, a Bible study somewhere or whatever it is, I'm, I'm, I'm going there and I, I want to be good soil. I want that Word to, to come into my life and to make a change in my life. The problem with far too many Christians, far too many of us, is we, we get the emotional side. We get the emotional side of a message or the emotional side of something that we hear. And then, boy, within 15 minutes, it's gone. The effect of the Word of God is supposed to change us continually. We have a faithful God, do we not? All right, the scriptures that you know, God is faithful. Uh, Brother Carl is going to come. We're going to close in, in singing a song about that in just a few moments. But the, 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 the understanding that as, as a child of God, I want my heart to be, to be cultivating and to growing in the Word of God. Let me just share this with you uh, in closing. I am very, very concerned about two things, really. One is what's going on in our, in our, in our nation. Um, we are faced as Christians with those who would desire, because of Satan and his work and his presence in this world, who would desire to destroy everything that we stand for from the Word of God. Amen. It, is, it is there. And, it, and, and the, the concern that I have is this. Far too many times Christians go to church, we listen to messages, Sometimes we do, we read the Bible or whatever, we do all of these things, and it's not really penetrating in our souls. It's not making the difference in our life. Why? It's because you have a heart that's stony, or you have a heart that is so hard, you, you, you don't, you know, it's like, you know, don't confuse me with the facts. Don't confuse me about the Word of God. We, we want, we need to be people who have hearts that are open and are cultivating what God's Word has to say. And we need to grow, whether that be in, in understanding doctrine or whether it be understanding the, the practical aspects of Scripture. We as a church need to be getting stronger and stronger and stronger in our confidence that this is God's Word. Amen? This is His Word to us. And, and I'm telling you folks, be prepared. Be prepared. Things are changing and going against everything that we stand for from God's Word. And so you need to be soil that is solid, good soil, taking up and just swallowing what the Word of God has to say. Because if not, 
If not, you're going to get just washed away in the culture in which we live. We need to be faithful. God is faithful. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He will never go away from us. But we as God's children need to be faithful and have hearts that are open to the teaching of the Word of God. Receive that challenge if you would. Father, I pray that as we close our service today, that we would be reminded of how faithful you are. Uh, Father God, I pray that our hearts would be hearts that would be, as the parable teaches, hearts that are good soil, that, that, are, that are taking in uh, the Word of God, and not just on an emotional level, but Father, that it, it, is, it is affecting our life uh, for your glory. And so, Father, I just pray for our church this morning that we would be challenged to have hearts that are good soil, hearts that will cultivate and grow the teaching of God's Word uh, throughout the course of our time here in ministry at, at South Pike Community Church. Father, we're so thankful that you're faithful. Uh, we are grateful for that. And your presence in our life makes a difference. So might we have hearts that are, that are cultivating the Word of God and growing closer to you as a result of it. Father, we live in a day and age which we are not going to be able to survive as Christians if we do not fully cultivate and take the teaching of God's Word and allow it to strengthen us and to cause us to grow. So, Father, continue to teach us. Thank you for your Word today. Thank you for the parable. May the simplicity of, of this parable uh, and the, uh, the challenges of the heart uh, be something that speaks to us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, let's, let's close our service today by turning to hymn number 43. We're just going to sing the first and third stanzas. Uh, Great is thy faithfulness. As we uh, sing this hymn together, let's just be reminded that it's God who is faithful. It's God who works in our life. And that uh, he's the one that's going to encourage us. Let's stand together and sing the first and third stanzas. Hymn number 43. Great is thy faithfulness. Continue to be faithful to his word. Be in his word. Uh, folks, today's Sunday, right? All right? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Be in the word. Okay? Don't, don't just be the one that comes and 
blows the dust off on Sunday morning. Be in the Word. God is faithful. Be a good soil for His glory. Father, I pray that you would encourage us. We have hope because of who you are and because of your faithfulness to us uh, in our lives. And so, Father, I just pray that as we go from your house today, that we be encouraged to be the soil that is cultivated, that we would grow in our walk with thee. Father, help us not to just get tied up in all the cares of this world. Every one of us that are here, uh, Father, the cares of this world can choke out all the things that, that you want to teach us throughout the course of a week. So I pray, Father, that our hearts would be cultivating and growing and uh, that we would not allow the things that are around us uh, to keep us from getting stronger in the Lord. And Father, again, we ask your blessing upon each one as we go from your house today. Uh, those that are watching online as well, Father, that you would encourage them and strengthen them. Thank you for the opportunity to give you glory and praise today in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. 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 Lord, get with you. Have a great week.